I've been preaching a series of messages on sermons from the jailhouse. And I promise you, I didn't go to jail to get them. I went to the Bible to get them. Amen. I have a different type of setting tonight I want us to listen to. I'll be in the book of Matthew chapter 11. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail in chapter 11 because we're preaching verse by verse through Matthew, and I don't want to repeat myself a great deal when we arrive there because we are in chapter, what is it, nine right now? And so we'll be there, oh, in a couple of years we'll be there, and we want to make sure that everything, <laughs> everything is new and fresh to us, amen. Um, chapter 11 of Matthew is about John the Baptist is imprisonment. And John the Baptist is one of my favorite characters. The Bible says that he came preaching in the wilderness. He's the cousin of Jesus Christ. He's six months older, and John the Baptist is preaching, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He never goes into the city of Jerusalem. He stays outside. He's an outdoorsman. John the Baptist is a rugged prophet. In fact, he is the last prophet of the Old Testament. And what a dynamic preacher he was. And if, if, if you haven't read already in the past, you'll see that John the Baptist was, no, was a no-nonsense prophet. He preached very dynamic and powerful. He dressed unusual, very unusual. The Bible says he was dressed up in camel's hair. And he ate locusts and wild honey in the wilderness. Spent all his time in the wilderness of, of uh, Judea and Jordan River, preaching and baptizing people as they confessed their sins to the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be standing in a river with a guy with camel's hair on that's got grasshopper juice oozing out of the crack of his mouth with sweet honey that's got dead bees in it. And he takes me out into Jordan and says, now confess your sins before we put you under. Well, first of all, I wouldn't want to be in Jordan confessing my sins to anybody. But that's how John the Baptist did it. He said, repent, the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven is at hand. There's coming one, the mighty one, the Christ, in whose shoes I'm unworthy to stoop down and loosen the latchet thereof. He says, John said, I baptize you with water, but there's coming one that will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. And that, of course, is Jesus Christ, the Son of Almighty God. Now, I, I got a little amused when it says he ate locusts and wild honey. Well, Judy and I were beekeepers. And there is no such thing as honey that's tame honey. Unless you go to the grocery store and buy it on aisle seven mixed with corn syrup. That's the only tame honey you're going to find. Those bees do not say, here it is. We want you to have it. I've never met a tame bee, especially when you're robbing their honey bank. They don't like it at all. In fact, you have to give them lots of smoke and, and really go after them and, and, and dress up quite well better than camel. Can you see John breaking into wild beehive? He's scooping it out like a bear, just getting it. And that's what he, he was a rugged prophet. Now, how many would like to sit under a pastor like that? Not me. But the, he ends up, John the Baptist ends up in prison. And let's stand for the reading of God's word, Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, we're going to read down to verse 12. It says, and it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commandment or commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in, in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou that should come, or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. 
and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitude concerning John, What went you out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken in the wind? But what went you out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft raiment or clothing are in king's houses. But, when, but what went you out to see? A prophet? Yea, I send you and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of a woman, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. I want to use for a subject this morning, or tonight, this morning, I've been been so messed up in my days and nights. I want to use for a message, uh, John the Baptist in prison. You may be seated. The voice of one crying in prison. The voice of one crying in prison. You say, well, now, preacher, in John chapter 1, they came out to see John the Baptist on Jordan Bank. Jerusalem sent some, some messengers to go to John the Baptist because John is really shaking up the place. All of Judea and the surrounding areas is going out to John to hear him and be baptized. And so some of the, the scribes and the Levites sent delegates to go talk to John. And when these delegates went to talk to John, John in chapter 1, in John chapter 1, he, he tells him, I am not the Christ. John the Baptist says, I am not the Christ. They said, well, who are you then? And they said, are you Elias? He said, I am not Elias. Well, who are you? Are you that prophet? And that's referring to Moses, how a prophet, that prophet would rise up and deliver the people. And he said, no, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. John the Baptist says, I am one voice crying in the wilderness. Prepare, the king is coming. Prepare, the Lord is coming. Prepare, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Get ready, prepare yourself, he's coming, he's here. Now, I want you to understand something about John the Baptist. This is incredible. When you look at him, he's told in the scriptures in John chapter 1 that he would see a sign that this is the Messiah. And Jesus is coming up Jordan Bank. He's walking up the, the Jordan uh, pathway. And John the Baptist points at Jesus, his cousin, the Son of God, and says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And when he baptized Jesus in Jordan, Matthew chapter 3 it is, before Jesus goes into the wilderness, he baptizes him, and as Jesus is coming up out of Jordan, the heavens break like thunder. God speaks his son. The father says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And while he's coming up, while Jesus is coming up out of the water, the Spirit of God descends upon Jesus like a dove and abodes on him, lights upon him. And now God told John the Baptist, you would see that sign. And he did see that sign. So we're, we're not talking about a prophet that didn't have information. We're talking about a prophet that knew his business. He knew who Jesus was. He, he talked about it. He preached about it. And he proclaimed many great glorious truths. But John the Baptist, because of his rigorous preaching, he uh, ended up in prison. In fact, what got him in prison was, as he told Herod Antipas, now Herod Antipas is the son of Herod the Great. And what happened was, is Herod Antipas took Philip, his brother's wife. He got rid of his wife, took his brother's wife, and John the Baptist looked at Herod 
Antipas, and Harris visited the meetings of John the Baptist. Uh, the Bible says that he was stirred. He, he rejoiced in the fire that John the Baptist had. He came out and went, whoo, what a preacher. Glory to God, you know. And Herod kind of had that little spell of, this is good preaching. Tell them, John. And John, in the process of his preaching, pointed his finger at Herod. He said, Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother Philip's wife. Well, her name was Herodias. And it got John in prison. In fact, Herodias was so angry that she talked Herod into putting him in prison. I don't think Herod really wanted to do it, but it was embarrassment. And so he put John the Baptist in prison. History tells us that the prison was in Micaiah, Machaerus, near the Dead Sea. And they tell us that the prison that John the Baptist was in was underground, pitch darkness. They were giving him a little food during the day and the evening, maybe just enough to keep him alive. And there in that underground dungeon, that prison, near the Dead Sea, he rotted for over one year. Some say he went close to two years. And so John the Baptist has got a lot of time on his hands. And when you've got a lot of time on your hands, if you're in prison, you've got a lot of time on your hands, especially in your darkness and you don't have much to do. There's, you know, I mean, you're just sitting there in darkness. You're bound. And so John the Baptist had a lot, a lot of time on his hands. And because he had a lot of time on his hands, John the Baptist had a lot of wrong thinking. The darkness began to play with his mind. The darkness and the bondage and the silence began to confuse him. What a preacher, what a prophet. But you need to understand that this prophet is an Old Testament prophet. He's, he's, he's latched between the Old Testament and the New. And he's the last of those prophets. And now he's in prison, and for one year, this is about the time frame, Jesus had sent his disciples out to heal the sick, to perform miracles in the previous chapter. And he told them to go to each city one by one and, and announce the gospel, the kingdom of heaven. Well, Jesus came along behind them and took care of the places they missed. It wasn't like Jesus went into the city and said, okay, how did Bartholomew do? Well, let me, let me fix this correctly. Jesus didn't go in behind them and fix the disciples' problems. The, the, the disciples did a good job. They learned that in the 70, uh, the 70 disciples or apostles that went out. So it doesn't mean that Jesus went behind them to make sure that they got it right. He went behind them to find the little villages that they missed. So with a fine-tooth comb, Jesus sends his disciples along with himself to announce the gospel, the kingdom of heaven. John the Baptist hears about this. In fact, there was one controversial prior to this where John the Baptist's disciples said to John, I hear they're baptizing more people than we are now. The disciples of Jesus are baptizing more people than we are now. And John said, don't worry about it. I must decrease. Jesus must increase. It's all in the plan of God. Little did John the Baptist know just how much he would decrease. And so he's arrested and put in prison. And there in prison, with plenty of time on his hands, he begins to have his mind filled with doubt and torture and horrific problems in his mind. And the disciples of John the Baptist no doubt hung around the prison, the disciples of John. And so John told two of his disciples, go down and find Christ. Verse three, and, it's, and he said unto them, art thou that should come? Are you the one that should come or do we look for another? He told his disciples, go down and find Jesus and ask him if he's the one. 
or do we look for another? Now, I see a strong, powerful prophet starting to waver. He's starting to doubt. Now, there's a couple of interpretations you might hear, and um, I, I cast out this one to this uh, one interpretation, but I'm going to give it to you so you can cast it out too. But I want to give you this one interpretation. It sounds really good, but because Jesus answered back to John, it doesn't make sense. What they, what they, uh, a lot of people believe is John told his disciples, instead of hanging around here, go find Jesus, ask him if he's the one that should come. And he was trying to steer his disciples to Jesus. But the, the, the faulty reason of that, it, that sounds noble and powerful, but the faulty reason of that is this. Why did Jesus send word back to John the Baptist? He didn't just send back word to John the Baptist, I'll take good care of you boys. No, he addressed the turmoil and the, and the agony in the mind of John the Baptist. So John the Baptist sends messengers to Jesus. He says, are you the Christ, or do we look for another? Now, I want you to understand something that the wording in the King James is very powerful. It says, verse 3, he said unto them, art thou, that's the disciples of John the Baptist, the two disciples in verse 2, says to him in verse 3, uh, says to Jesus, art thou the one that should come, or do we look for another? Now, we can stop right there and say, well, John wasn't putting it together. John said, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. But John wasn't putting it together. John was hung up in the Old Testament because he's an Old Testament prophet. And John was thinking that Jesus would come and set up his kingdom now. You follow me? And so he didn't use, are you the Christ? He says, or do we look for another? Is there someone else going to come behind you and set up the kingdom? And Jesus Christ did not rebuke John the Baptist. He just said, go tell him that I'm not done. Go tell him I'm the one. Go tell him I've got this under control. Go tell him it's okay. Go tell him I am he. And here's what I want you to tell John the Baptist. He tells those two delegates that John sent. He says, you go tell him. The blind receive their sight. This is the scroll that he read in Isaiah 60, there in the temple, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have gospel preached to them. So he says, tell John that I'm still doing my stuff. Tell John I'm going to take care of this. Tell John, hang on, I'm the Messiah. Hang on, I've got a plan. But first, I've got to save the world from sin and death. Now, John was trying to understand this because I want you to listen to what John is thinking. And you say, how do you know what he's thinking? He's just like the rest of us. In his mind, he's thinking, I'm his cousin. Jesus is my cousin. I hear him about him raising the dead. I hear him about him casting out devils. I hear about him opening blinded eyes. He's got power, unbelievable power. In him is the fullness of the Godhead. In him is the Holy Ghost without measure. Why doesn't he come over here and bust me out of prison? He's letting me down. I'm, not only am I the prophet, and not only am I preaching the gospel and I've done nothing wrong, I'm in jail. Some people go to jail because they belong in there. Some people go to jail because of nothing they done, and John was in jail because of nothing, just preaching the gospel. And John probably thought, well, why won't Jesus just come and bust me out? If he can raise the dead, he can surely raise me out of this dark prison. So John's beginning to doubt himself, and then he, I believe he even thought, well, he's my cousin. Cousins stick together with cousins. But here's the sad, potent truth. Jesus is going to let John the Baptist die. Now, I want you to understand something. 
Jesus wasn't in the habit of letting people die. When Lazarus died, he raised him from the grave. When Jesus was on the cross, he died first so he wouldn't have to watch the other two die. Wherever Jesus was, people didn't die. People always lived. But Jesus refused to go to the prison and bring John out because Jesus knew that John had to die just like all the other prophets of old. He knew that. John wasn't too sure about that. So I'm going to get to preaching in a minute. I'm just sharing an introduction. <laughs> this is your introduction. I'll preach in a minute. So John, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, preparing the way for Jesus Christ. John, this dynamic preacher, John the Baptist, this incredible man of God is now in jail for preaching the gospel, for standing against sin, for standing against Herod. He's there, been there a year, underground, in darkness. He sends word by his disciples, why don't you do something? Are you the one or do we look for another? And Jesus Christ says, I'm the one. Hold on, go tell John, I'm still kicking devils around. Go tell John, I'm still healing the sick. Go tell John, I'm still cleansing the leper. Go tell John, I'm still raising the dead. Go tell John, I'm still in business. So Jesus, deliberately, in the plan of God, allowed John the Baptist to be beheaded. He allowed John to die. And when John did die, Jesus was greatly grieved. And we're not going to get into that story because of time's sake, but he was deeply moved when he heard that John would, had died. It, it really troubled him because he knew that he could have stopped it, but deeply troubled. But I want you to notice this one, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Now he's the voice of one crying in prison. Please hear me. The next three points I'm going to share with you, you need to write them down, crystallize them in your mind, and never forget the message from John the Baptist prison. These three things we learn because Jesus is going to let John the Baptist die. Here's the three lessons. Number one, remember what God has done and what God is doing. If you find your place in darkness, if you find your place, find yourself in the place of despair, if you find yourself in the place of discouragement, down, brokenhearted, remember what God has done and remember what God is doing. Focus. Isn't that what John, isn't that what Jesus sent word to John? Focus on what I'm doing. He sent word to John the Baptist, focus on what I've done and focus on what I'm doing. Focus on what the, the good message that, at Jordan Bank, focus on what I'm doing. Notice, remember what God has done and what he is doing. If you'll remember what God has done in your life and what he is doing in others' lives. See, the thing is, we don't get all fired up. Whoop, glory to God. Hallelujah. God bless my brother. No, we get more excited. Whoop, hallelujah. God bless me. But we ought to be so connected as one body in Christ that we rejoice when another brother or sister is blessed. That we rejoice in what God is doing. And that's basically what Jesus was try, trying to tell John the Baptist. Rejoice in what I'm doing. He sent word to, uh, through John's disciples, go tell him I'm still opening blinded eyes. I'm still raising the dead. Get happy, John. I'm still doing the work. Got a plan, John. Sit there in that prison in the darkness. I've got it covered, John. Hold on, John. You'll be home after a while. He didn't know that John was about to get his head chopped off. Jesus did, but John didn't know it. And Jesus is going to let John die in prison. 
I want to say to you, when things are not going your way, think back to what Jesus did on the cross. Think back to what Jesus is doing now in other people's lives. And focus on the fact that God is alive. Second lesson we must learn. Don't get offended when Jesus, or don't get offended with Jesus for what he, has, for what he is not doing. Let me repeat that again. Don't get offended with Jesus for what he is not doing. Especially for what he is not doing for you. Because the next verse, verse 6, blessed is he that whosoever shall not be offended in me. He's telling John and those around, John's disciples and others, don't get offended in me for what I don't do. Don't get offended in me if you find yourself in a prison. Don't get offended in me if you find yourself in a hellish storm. Don't get offended in me if, if you think I ought to be doing something in your life and I haven't done it. Don't get offended in me if others are blessed and you're, you feel like you're not. Don't get offended in me if you feel like I passed you by. John, hey, John, in prison. Hey, cousin, hey, John, the Baptist, don't get offended in me for what I'm not doing. I think God ought to move in my life. Well, I do too. But the sad truth is, most people don't get offended in Jesus or with Jesus because he blesses them. I don't know of anybody that gets offended with Jesus when he blesses them. But I know a lot of people that's left the church because they got offended because God didn't come across with the way they thought he should. I know a lot of people that preachers have lied to and told them that God was going to do something, and then God didn't do it because the preacher had lied to them and because their loved one wasn't healed or because their loved one wasn't delivered or because that ship did not come in. They don't get offended with the preacher. They get offended with Jesus because he didn't do what they thought he should do. Amen. Amen. Don't get offended with Jesus for what he is not doing. And that's what Jesus is saying to John the Baptist. Don't get offended in me for what I'm not doing. And I guarantee you John the Baptist knew that he was not busting him out of prison. He was not there. He was not coming. He was not moving. Why, God? I've done all the right things. I've lived the right way. I got put in here for preaching righteousness and, and preaching against sin. I'm in prison. Why am I rotting in this dark place? I can't see my hand in front of my uh, eyes. I can't see anything. I'm in this prison. Don't know what's going on. What's the matter with you, Jesus? What's wrong with you? You're my cousin. You're the son of God. You're the Messiah. Why don't you come and bust me out of this darkness. Well, it wasn't God's plan for John to be set free. It was God's plan for John to be beheaded. Because he's going to join all the other Old Testament prophets. Isn't that good? I love music to my preaching. Amen. Answer it so they can listen to the sermon. But anyway, yeah, let him hear the sermon. Now, the first thing we need to remember, the first lesson from this voice from prison, this voice crying from prison, the first lesson, remember what God has done and what he's doing, what he's doing in other people's lives, what he's done in the past. Remember your good God. Second, don't get offended with Jesus for what he is not doing. Number three, and oh, this is a scorcher. Number three, it's not all fun. You don't always have it your way. Did you hear me? There's a lot of people who leave a church if they can't have it their way. Are you listening to me? There's a lot of pastors that quit pastoring church because they can't have it their way. There's a lot of deacons that will leave a church because they can't have it their way. 
A lot of people would leave and they'll walk away because they can't have it their way. But don't you ever leave Jesus Christ because you can't have it your way. God is not going to always let you have it your way. God has a plan. And that plan may be some rocky moments in your life. That plan may be some dark times in your life. That plan may be something that's devastating. God has a plan. Don't get offended in Jesus Christ. It's not all fun. You won't always have it your way. Now, there's a lot of preachers out there telling you you can have it your way. You can always have it your way. But that's not what the Bible says. Don't you just love a church where you can come and hear what the Bible says? Everybody, and, and I don't want to spend too much time in chapter 11 because what we're going to do is we're going to be in it after a while on Sunday morning. But I, I want to give you scripture for it's not all fun. You won't always have it your way. Here it is. We live in a spoiled generation. When Jesus came, the generation was spoiled. And they're still spoiled. Churches are spoiled. Christians are spoiled. Non-Christians are spoiled. Americans are spoiled brats. Amen? Our, we were out of power after this storm that went through. Not a limb came down in my yard, but the power went off. I called Chuck up and I said, the power's off at my house. I guess I hadn't been paying my tithes good. Chuck just laughed and I said, don't you laugh, your power's off too. <laughs> now, I guarantee you there was people calling the power company every 15 minutes. I guarantee you, if people fit to be tied, they were angry because it was hot. They were angry because their refrigerator wouldn't work. They were angry because they'd flip a switch on 15 times every five minutes. You say, how do you know that? I watch my grandkids. No, they do that even when the electricity does work. But anyway, because we're a spoiled people, spoiled generation, and it was that way when Jesus came. Let me give you verse 13 through 17, chapter 11, Matthew. For the, all the prophets of the law prophesied until John. That's why John's included in the old prophets. And if ye will receive it, this is Elias, that's Elijah, which was for to come. That's in Malachi chapter 3. John the Baptist was not Elias, but he came in the spirit or the figurative of Elijah. Elijah will come when Jesus returns the second time to planet earth. But John the Baptist led Jesus into his first coming. Elijah will lead Jesus into his second coming. Now, notice it says in verse 15, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. I hope you heard me just now. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? Here it is. It is like unto children sitting in the markets, calling unto their fellows, saying, we have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned, and you have not lamented. Now, this, this uh, piping was an instrument that they'd use for weddings, celebration. They would pipe their music and people would dance and celebrate in the weddings. The same pipe would be used in a monotone way for funerals. And Jesus said, the generation's like this. How do I like them generate? You can't make them happy. Wedding or funeral. We've, we've piped to your music, dance for me. John the Baptist, dance for me. Preacher, perform for me. Jesus, dance for me. And if there's a funeral, Tell the whole world that we're all going to heaven, glory to God. Don't tell us about death and hell and dying. This has been a kind of a weighty sermon. But I hope you've listened to me carefully because John the Baptist was truly an incredible prophet. 
And I want to say this about John the Baptist before we wrap this thing up. There's some things you've got to say about John the Baptist that can't be said about us. Remember, the Bible says that Jesus said there's no greater than John the Baptist. There's, there's never been a greater. Did you know John the Baptist was Jesus' hero? Jesus loved John the Baptist. John the Baptist was his hero. But he's going to let his hero die. And, John, and Jesus Christ says to John the Baptist, oh, he's something else. What went you out to see? Reed shaking in the wind? Fancy clothing? Ah, he wasn't like that at all. He's fiery, powerful. And Jesus said to them, John the Baptist come. He's the greatest prophet of all. Notwithstanding, those that are the least of the kingdom is greater than he. Now, John the Baptist never healed the sick. He never performed a miracle. He led people to Jesus. But John the Baptist, Jesus declares that the least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. And no prophet is ever greater than John the Baptist. Here's what I want you to listen to. And this is very dynamic. This is powerful. John the Baptist had to die as an Old Testament prophet. He never enjoyed the new covenant. Yes, he was born full of the Holy Ghost, the power of God on his life. But he never had the abiding Holy Spirit seal of God in his heart because John the Baptist was never born again. John the Baptist was of the old covenant. And you and I, the reason we're greater than he is because the very person of Jesus lives inside of us as Christians. Notwithstanding the least in the kingdom, been born again, knows Christ. John didn't get to see Jesus raised from the dead, but we have it, we did as a church. John the Baptist didn't see the fulfillment. He died before it was fulfilled. But you and I have seen it all. We, we know that the Lord's coming is victorious. Isn't that beautiful? Let me, let me just say tonight, you won't always have it your way. In fact, God may choose you not to have it your way. It won't always be your way. You may be in a place that God will allow you to stay. I know you don't want to hear that, but it's true. All God requires of us, if, if we're in a place we don't want to be strapped to, if we're in a place we don't want to be bound, all the new covenant teaches us is this. You might be in prison physically, but you'll never be in prison spiritually. The devil might put a wall around you, but God will not allow him to put a roof, a lid over you. You can never, you, you can always worship your God. Even when it looks like God's helping everybody but you. You can worship God. You can praise God. Because the God that created the universe lives inside of you as a born again child of God. And you can give God praise in the dark moments. Give God praise in the hard moments. Give God praise when the baby dies. Give God praise. When a loved one dies, give God praise. When a child dies, give God praise. When something don't go your way, when a spouse dies, a mate dies, something happens you don't understand, give God praise. Not praise for it, but praise in it. Rejoice in God, not because it happened, but because there's a better world than this one. There's a promise beyond here. There's a God of heaven. Because you see, Jesus is not done yet. He's not finished. He's still doing his work. Now this sermon would not be preached in most of the mega churches around the land. This sermon would not be preached in most of the get it quick, blab it and grab it program. But I guarantee you this is real life Bible preaching. This is real stick to in our heart. And I can't control everything around me, but I can control this heart of mine that beats for Jesus. I can't control everything around me, but I can, I can control my mouth and I can control my thoughts as far as yielding to the Lord. And I can control my prayer and my praise. 
and I will not be offended in Jesus. There's some things Jesus hasn't done for me, but I'm not offended with him. I'll never be offended in my Jesus. He's done too much for me. Stand with me. We're going to give a song. Maybe you're struggling with something. Maybe, maybe you're struggling with the death of a, a loved one. Maybe you're struggling with a, with a heartbreak in your life. Maybe you're struggling with a, with a dark time in your life. Maybe, you're, maybe you don't understand some things. You're no greater than John the Baptist other than the fact that we as born-again believers are greater in servanthood. John the Baptist was a magnificent man of God. I want to invite you, no matter how strong you are, no matter how strong you are, no matter how, how much you believe and how much you trust, and no matter what you've seen, John the Baptist saw the Spirit of God descend like a dove upon Jesus. John the Baptist heard the Father speak from heaven, this is my beloved Son. Yet all that John saw, all that John felt, all that John did, still staggered in doubt in the dark prison in the moment of his adversity. John the Baptist was told by Jesus, don't be offended in me. Trust me, I'm the one. It'll be okay. Hang on. God has a plan. Don't let go. Don't be bitter. Don't be angry with God. Honor your God. Honor's open.